This is the DNT One to One Show, episode eight, recorded on the third of May, two thousand and thirteen. Okay, it's uh, great to be here on the One to One Show, and this week uh, uh, our guest is Michela Magas, who is uh, co-founder of the company uh, Stromatolite, and uh, also she's the founder of uh, the Music Tech Fest. So we're going to talk about uh, both of those, those things today. So hi, Michela, and great to have you on. How's it going? Hi, very well, thanks. We are sort of rushed off our feet, but um, <laughs> still managing to sort of keep focus. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, I wanted to start by talking about um, you know, Stromatolite uh, as a company and then maybe move on to uh, chatting about the Music Tech Fest because that's uh, coming up in uh, just, just about three weeks and it's uh, super exciting. So uh, first of all, uh, Stromatolite started quite a few years ago. So can you just uh, go tra trace back the, the history of the company and, and uh, what kind of projects you've been, you've been involved in over the years? Well, we founded the company in 2000. It was um, Peter Russell Clark and myself. Um, we started with the, w w there wasn't really an agenda. It was very much um, it re very much reflected who we were at the time, and we were very much into design innovation. We were teaching students about new directions, and we were getting also projects that were uh, with Nike Futures, for instance. Uh, to look at the future of the brand. Um, so there were things that we found exciting, things that we believed in and we felt needed to be pushed through. Particular, particularly at that time, it was innovation in the sphere of uh, mass production and a product, as well as um, the, the future of the digital um, industries or uh, digital applications, which, uh, I mean, this sounds like a very long time ago now, but. Yeah. Uh, the landscape looked incredibly static and um, we felt that innovation was really lacking in that respect. Yeah, sure. Of so, um, yeah, so this is this was basically the starting point. Um, as it happened, we, we ended up working with people like Nike and Apple and Nokia on various different things. I got involved with the Apple on the um, beginnings of iTunes and especially when iTunes came over to Europe I've been I was working from them uh, with them right from the start now what happened um, there was that there was no R&D money to be you know thrown at uh, when Apple started in Europe it had two people on marketing for 80 something countries yeah. um, so it had uh, very low resources on that front and I realized that if we were to go and s explore this area it had to be done uh, without corporate money and, it, and uh, I was very lucky to be invited by a um, guy who came from MIT and who was um, um, doing um, well, he was applying for a project here in the UK um, from the grant uh, bodies yeah. together with uh, Queen Mary, University of London and uh, Goldsmiths yeah. uh, for new ways of searching for music. It was right. an engineering project. I trained as a designer on Royal College of Art, trained, and so, so is Peter, essentially. And, um, um, I came from a background that's not uh, customary to be included in those types of grants, but I was very, very lucky that um, they invited me along because they heard of the work I was at that time doing with uh, some of the ideas I was developing, um, both with iTunes and with Peter Gabriel's companies. Yeah, sure. In the meantime, um, things evolved on the product side within Apple, and Peter got invited to join uh, the industrial design group. Um, uh, and uh, you know Jonathan Ives group um, and as of January 2006 he went over there yeah. this was our pre-iPhone we were we go straight out of um, restructuring Nokia design teams just yeah. before that and so at that time he was heavily focused on mobile phones and he went straight in there um, on, on those projects yeah. basically this is how things evolved I then ended up uh, literally um, downscaling and uh, I plunged myself into re research uh, so many years of research so following the invitation to join this project uh, on new ways of searching for music plunging at the deep end literally as a sort of trained designer and self-trained programmer um, but we're talking about people who had spent uh, by that time um, somewhere in the region of six to ten years investigating um, all 
signal processing um, and other ways of extracting information from music. Yeah. Uh, we're talking high level experts, uh, which obviously I couldn't possibly match um, overnight. So it meant a huge amount of research and a huge amount of work um, to build the knowledge to be able to deal with these systems, yeah. uh, not just at the front end, um, so not as, as just as a user interface um, expert, but as uh, and not just in terms of front end innovation. Um, but in order to innovate properly, one needed to know all the ins and outs and how um, the engineering aspects, the scientific aspects, work. Yeah. Um, so this, this this is this is quite a ride you know yeah. it's this is a serious roller coaster absolutely absolutely and you, and you always had like um it's interesting to see that you had such a f strong focus on brands and uh, and sort of collaborating with them as well uh, with That's the music right. strand because of course you know in the last couple of years all we're hearing about the music conference is, uh, is uh, you know how brands are going to save the day and how important brands are to musicians and, and all of that which is uh, questionable in itself but, uh, yes, but, that's right. but, but it's interesting that you were working in that field you know a, a long time ago yes but that's a, my experience was uh, with commercial brands with the innovation units in commercial brands yeah uh, now I was, ta I was tackling innovation from the academic side um, because it is still, we're still talking, essentially we're, at the core we're talking about the same thing, we're talking about innovating in the uh, technological sphere um, and driving new business models with it and it's yeah. at that junction, that junction becomes really important because where you uh, identify there are new tools available, you then need to turn them into a product that can be both understood by the mass market and applied by the brands or has to be branded and then has to be uh, disseminated and uh, made useful um, by um, by the major uh, uh, members of the uh, music industry of course but the, the the in order to do that, you also need business models that go with it. Yeah. Um, and very often in our landscape, business models emerge as you start using a product. Um, case in point being Shazam, which um, started driving huge audiences over to iTunes. iTunes had to reassess how they um, pay people for, to drive their audiences their way because. Um, there was such vast volume being driven their way, then they couldn't, they, they needed, they it pro provided a very good engine for them. Yeah. Um, so they need to reassess their model. But then as it turns out, Shazam is now, um, has now created new uh, markets um, by working with American networks. Of course. So um, by attaching their system to the advertising that's on television, they can identify the song that's attached to an advert and if someone sends, um, the, if someone identifies that song, they can send them vouchers for that particular product. So there's a whole loop of, uh, there's a whole market that's been created in that space. Absolutely. Um, this is something we couldn't have guessed several years ago when Shazam started. And it is um, admirable that the uh, capital that's invested in these companies um, is based on. Um, yeah. the potential of this technology without necessarily seeing where the revenue is going to come from or perhaps uh, assuming that one type of revenue is going to be available but in truth it turns out that if you stick with it you might actually find some really lucrative revenue streams further down the line. Yeah. This is the sort of os op landscape we operate in. It's inc incredibly experimental both on the business model side as well as on the technological innovation so exactly and, and and it makes it uh, of course for a company like Shazam it made it a lot easier the fact that it was not a company that was burning cash uh, by paying labels for licensing fees it was a relatively lean company where they could it was just profit generating wh when they you know through affiliate uh, once they got the mass of users and they got the technology working then the affiliate fees started to come in and then it started to make sense as a business model so that that's correct well that was the first um, step from the business model. I think that they are the um, the partnership with brands and with tele uh, with um, the television um, networks in America. I think it's is actually showing to be. Um, I, I would guess uh, a lot more lucrative than just um, of course the affiliate program. So um, this is 
this, this can only happen once you start using um, this new technology and start discovering new ways of, of um, creating a market yeah. and creating revenue. Um, so on that side, it's interesting. It's interesting how technology impacts on new business models. So um, the technology that came out of my research um, and my PhD um, is basically uh, focusing on a um, new way of searching for music that would open up uh, back catalogs and uh, up and coming artists and uh, world music, so called world music, which I, you know, it's a term which I really, I, I, I really don't like. And, uh, you know, the idea of the genre of world music is just so patronizing from, from, from the West. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So this, this is something that was an ambition of mine. Um, I was very interested to see what can be done in terms of opening up um, access to all these artists, yeah. opening up access to the long tail. And this was the starting point of the research. And of course, Anne Root uh, discovered a whole load of other um, applications and interesting um, issues that this research raises. Yeah. Um, both in terms of um, technical challenges and in terms of uh, the applications and business models that can be created. So it's actually a really big space. Um, and my PhD was a, a practice-based PhD, yeah. uh, which is why it, it, basically as part of this um, project, I was given a PhD grant. Um, and the practice side of things basically just exploded and it's now um, turned into two spin-offs already. Yeah. Um, with <laughs> I have no time to write up <laughs> with it. So I'm being told off the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, Sonaris uh, is actually one of the spin-offs, right? Sonaris is one of the the, the spin-offs that happened. Um, it it started. Uh, it, it came from the PhD research. And from working with all these phenomenal academics who um, uh, really know their stuff, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful space uh, to be working in. Um, and the um, it was aided by the Technology Strategy Board, um, yeah. where um, I applied to take this to market, to do a proof of concept, to take it to market, because I believed it was the right time to do that. Yeah. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a grant from the Technology Strategy Board and invited a fellow PhD from the Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona um, to uh, collaborate with me on this project, on this grant. And the two PhDs came together in ways that uh, we didn't expect. So we came into it from slightly different approaches. Yeah. Um, both with intention of creating something that's, that can be used by the mass market, particularly in the sense that all the matching of music that was being researched was pre predominantly researched in the classical music sphere because these are the, these were the collections that people could access. Yeah. When you try to apply to popular collections, it was really difficult to get good results. Um, and we wanted to focus on that. We wanted to create it as a useful tool for everyone. Yeah. And it just turned out that the t our two approaches, when they came together, the whole game was more than some of its parts. So we had one of those moments of, wow, you know, did we really hear this? This is, you know, great. Um, and we realized we were onto something. Yeah. Um, we got a very good review um, by the Technology Strategy Board and bear in mind this was before, it was just at the, big, well, at the beginning when Technology Strategy Board were uh, beginning to think about um, the music industry as another potential area where they should encourage projects to go to. Um, and we were asked to write a case study and to submit to the government to show how new technologies can change the um, music industry business model as a result of this. Yeah. Because what this allowed to do was to um, create a licensing system where you could open up back catalogues um, of famous artists and, you know, very typically, a really big artist will be living off a handful of hits yeah. 
and the rest is um, is not really being used for licensing. Um, and uh, there are lots of up and coming artists who are cheaper to license for smaller productions, um, let's say short movies or uh, digital productions, which are on the increase. Um, and all of those could be made available as long as someone could find them and find the right sound for their movie or yeah. for their production. And this proved to be a very powerful business model. So um, we collaborated with Peter Gabriel um, and his venture Q Songs, yeah. uh, which is a new way for licensing music. Of course, uh, we've had a ad on the show before. Right. So we still work with them. And um, they have very successfully managed to convince all major labels to clear um, music, to pre-clear music for licensing. Yeah. Uh, and it creates a, a very attractive model for all agencies and all companies, because all companies now have to have videos to promote themselves and also at trade shows and trade yeah. fairs, it's all full of videos and notoriously getting music clearance is incredibly hard. Um, one um, uh, stakeholder, uh, one agency, uh, told us that for an internal presentation video, they had to pay £5,000 to clear the license for this piece of music yeah. uh, that they wanted to use from a, from a major label. Um, these prices are really prohibitive, uh, especially for smaller agencies. And um, the system now allows you to uh, get music from say, for, say, £100. Um, to uh, maybe a couple of thousand if you need to run it for a long time or you need to uh, uh, run it uh, on a global platform. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's a very useful system in this growing market. And so basically, you know, the the what you're saying is that the the technology of Sonaris was incorporated within the back end of of the technology of Sonaris is uh, that we we. Uh, the technology of Sonaris is being used for a whole load of experimentations and demos yeah. at the moment. Yeah. The technology on the site, we implemented a um, really uh, strong uh, engine by a company called Barcelona Music Audio Technologies, right. which is really big on uh, data. Uh, it has very large collections of data about every single piece of music and this enabled us to launch the licensing system. Yeah. Uh, what our technology is doing is looking at it more uh, on the uh, identifying the, uh, analyzing the audio itself, um, rather focusing on that principally, um, on adding some machine learning in order to teach the machine what cultural trends mean. And this is pretty tricky. Yeah. Uh, this is this is very powerful. And these are the things we're experimenting on with at the moment. So Q has got two sides to it. Yeah. One is the um, publicly facing um, engine, which is driven by Barcelona Music Audio Technologies, and the other one is the pro side, where we are uh, looking at new ways in which um, professional editors can access. The segments of music or individual clips. Yeah. Um, the reason why uh, we approach it in this way is because highly creative filmmakers, they have a very fixed idea of what they need with a visual and they cannot go and search for something by describing a track as being singer, songwriter, etc. because it really doesn't give you the feel of it. Yeah. What you really need is to say here is the sort of sound I need for this 30 seconds in here. Yeah. And if I want to access a large library of artists, not just production music, production music of course plays a big part in this too, I need to be able to search for it with my ears. And what, w the way we approach it is we think of music as uh, not a track, which is an old Motown a model um, which was wonderful at the time, of course, um, it was a piece of vinyl uh, or a nice length that fitted between radio transmissions and Motown turned this into an art form and we sti still stick to this three to four uh, minutes of music. Yeah. Uh, now it seems to be kind of a handy format that 
everybody kind of has, has, has latched onto. But as we well know, you know, this has been challenged early on, you know, you cannot search for the dark side of the moon by trying to describe it with metadata. It's, it's yeah. a nightmare. Um, so the way that we think about music is in terms of a musical phrase, yeah. a meaningful musical phrase. And we have algorithms that can detect musical phrases within music. And these then are matched by uh, particularly uh, mood, uh, not mood in a very kind of crass way, mood in a, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a it's a tricky one because you know lots of people do very, very basic things with mood. They have like five moods and then everything belongs to one of them. Um, yeah. When you say mood, is the best way to describe what I would call the zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, and this is because a piece of music evolves in real time. So if you, if you ask my opinion on this, the, the piece of music is not finished once it's released out in, 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 to the open. It actually starts to live and evolve with the audience. Yeah. And so if something is suddenly used for a movie, and I always quote the example from Reservoir Dogs, so if you do Stuck in the Middle, you know, you could have interpreted that piece in in fairly innocent ways before it was used in the ear cutting scene in Reservoir Dogs. But you have to be very aware of the cultural perception of that track. Otherwise, you you know, someone might use it in 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 a baby food advert or something. Like that, you know? So you, you can't you can't allow that to happen. So what you have to be is aware of the significance of that piece of music and that cultural moment yeah. and that is particularly hard to achieve you can't do that just with signal analysis of no. course the computer hasn't got a clue about these sorts of things you can't do, do that just with crowdsource tagging because that would need to change from day in day out so i would need to sort of add a tag and saying violent scene hello um so this is where it becomes really really interesting is how do you train systems to recognize it and that that takes quite a bit of work if yeah. you're trusting in that one. There's lots of different ways in which it's effectively music AI. Yeah. And yeah. and we really, really look at intelligence behind music and we look at how we can train this to recognize um, a, you know the mood of a piece of music changes with the time of day even. You know, yeah. I mean typically and crassly sort of as an example, you know, slow music is usually transmitted late at night, la la la. But even so, you know, you would describe it with different words. If you, if I were to ask you at two in the morning to describe me a thing, uh, you would. I mean, it depends on whether you're in a rave or whether you're just chilling. But you would probably describe it with different words than when I asked you first thing in the morning. So, all, all of these things count, and we're building and building the knowledge and the AI behind music in order to be able to drive the system in an intelligent way. And then when the results come through, people just kind of gasp and they go. How did you get? How did you get this exact same? It sounds the same voice and almost the same words, and it's just really kind of freaking me out. And this is kind of this is a, an unknown artist, and you just match it with a, like um, uh, a record that sold millions, and you know, go, whoa, yeah, there you go. And and then it turns out that this artist has recorded before a famous artist, so they couldn't have copied. So there's no copyright infringement problem. So you're doing something that's totally legitimate. And you're discovering things that are now can be dragged out of the vaults. Yeah. And said, hey guys, if you like this, you'll probably like that. So our latest sniffer that we've written is um, we are uh, able to sniff anything you listen to on YouTube, from anything from your library. It basically sits in the background and listens. A bit like Shazam. Shazam kind of uh, w uh, works by pointing your, your phone to in public spaces uh, to, to sort of speakers. But um, uh, we can have it on your desktop if you're a producer or, uh, and you're watching a video and there's a piece of music in there that's really, really right for your movie. Of course, you could never afford to pay this band or whatever. You just turn on the sniffer. It goes five seconds and it just does that. It comes out with a list of... Here's stuff that's available right now. It's like Getty Images. Click, license, download, off you go. Awesome. That's that's that fast. That's fantastic. And uh, and just so in case people were interested in that, uh, that are listening, is it, is this a beta program or is it something they can they can get from somewhere? It's 
uh, it's 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 still beta. Um, yeah. It's um, something that um, it, you know it, it's ready. It's working. It's uh, we're processing the Q library at the moment. We're testing it for these pro situations. Sure. Um, and um, it, it it's something that if people are interested, they can get in touch with us and uh, all demos are available sure. um, Great. so people can have a look and play with it if they if they wish awesome. to um, so let them you know they can just get in touch great uh, that's great well uh, that, that's fantastic it's a really great it's insight on, on sonaris.org there's um, like just, just an info link great. on there so they're welcome to you know because we're working with with um, uh, some of these um, uh, partners and uh, this is something that um, uh, is is really just on, based on in inquiries, individual yeah. inquiries at the moment. Um, the That's other great. thing that has happened as a result of there are three things that have happened as a result of the PhD research that I was doing, and uh, one thing, another other thing that happened was that I proposed to the European Commission to run the roadmap for the future of music uh, technology yeah. uh, because I felt that that area was really left behind. Um, in comparison to uh, gaming and broadcasting on yeah. their agenda. And music streaming is massive, as we all know. And when, at the time that I applied, it was becoming big. And I emphasize that this is an area that definitely needs to be explored. Yeah. And that the field of research of music information retrieval that I was part of needs to be opened up um, and rather than it focusing chiefly on, um, on signal processing, it needs to be opened up to uh, music, uh, to mu uh, musicologists, to psychologists, to other fields that look at music, to other ways in which we can extract da data about music, uh, uh, in order to make this, these systems uh, interesting and also more applicable to the mass market and more applicable to the music and creative industries. Yeah. And sure. fortunate enough that um, I had uh, in the consortium, um, we had uh, in absolutely incredible uh, partners, um, this including um, you know Centre for Digital Music at Queen Mary and Universidad de Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, which I mentioned earlier. Um, here come uh, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, which is the biggest French right. uh, institute for this. Um, Offi Centre for Artificial Intelligence in Vienna, um, Center in uh, Ineshk in Porto, and uh, the Barcelona Music Audio Technologies. Hope I haven't missed anybody out. Yeah. Um, so we, sorry, stuff That's going nice. on all the time. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so, so these parts are uh, oh, absolutely phenomenal knowledge of this area, and we were able to. I mean, it was. People always tell you that public funding projects. And either get terribly uh, tiresome or boring or something. And our project, well, honestly, uh, it was my feeling, but I think it was shared by the partners. We were all really sorry uh, when we had to wrap up and finalize our roadmap earlier this month. Yeah. Because the conversations, and I'm not joking, the conversations in our workshops started at 9 in the morning and ended at 11 at night with people kind of falling over, but they were still enthusiastic and saying, well, you know, wondering, looking at all the different fields in which this can be expanded, all the ways yeah. in which we can formalize things. And, um, wow, that's great. It, it's really uh, exciting. The The roadmap is now, It's it, the project the acronym was MIRES, M-I-R-E-S, and uh, it's MIRES.cc. Um, the roadmap can be seen on there and can be downloaded from there, and I think it's going to make, um, hopefully it will make quite a difference because we've introduced huge amount of creativity, creative industries into it which weren't there before but also consolidated and expanded on the technical and scientific uh, areas, introduced very much the multiculturalism aspect into music, so not research just done on Western collections, yeah. so I keep going on about this, um, and uh, uh, also uh, social, so social media related things which are incredibly relevant. And as part and parcel of this, um, I propose that we would join up academia and industry, and this is notoriously difficult. The reason being is that the two have to speak different languages in order to operate and yeah. survive. 
and do well in their sphere. Um, there has to be a high focus in academia and there has to be a very speedy, short, sharp decision-making process in, in the industry. And, of course, the, the operators in these, the stakeholders, are trained to think in different ways and therefore when they try to speak to each other, they just really find it difficult to translate. It's like being lost in translation. Sure. I was fortunate enough to be labelled innovation catalyst by the European Commission on this front because I am able to speak both languages and therefore I am able to connect the two. Um, and as part of this, uh, we decided that we were going to do some workshops and invite people from both academia and industry, but including everybody else. So sure. all the creative people who work in music, all the people who are hacking into music, people who are innovating and performing, and looking at it from all sorts of different aspects, people who are crossing over into technology from being a performer, or people who are technologists who also play an instrument, or um, th there are really lots of crossovers between science and yeah. art in this area, and it's actually really strong when you look at the history of music. Um, musicians always had some knowledge of engineering, or rather a great deal of, of uh, the, the music industry have a lot of knowledge of engineering too. Um, it is the nature of, of, of the beast. So in that sense, um, there was a lot of knowledge that could be shared. When we launched this idea, and I went and had 60 hours worth of meetings with all the different um, people in the industry and different SMEs and different people who are involved in, in, in developing new things for music, it turned out everybody was jumping and saying, this is a great idea, we really need to all be in the same space. And we all need to be creative together. And it was very much a creative um, festival, festival yeah. ideas that, that it, it turned into with ridiculously low funding, with us not sleeping for days, or just so we get it. And we're actually at that stage at the moment. Um, and now we're, again, we are non profit. We we're insisting at the moment on, on, on encouraging the crowd to come together. And we, we, want, we, we don't want it um, at this stage. Um, to be um, focused on revenue or anything like that. Sure. Um, so um, it, it just wouldn't be useful to, to all the people involved yeah. um, to be sidetracked by that. And I think it's better, very much about the community um, and about what the community can do. And, and um, um, of course, uh, as, uh, as a central... Um, as, as a place where everybody comes in under the same roof, all these ideas that get exchanged produce a huge amount of value out there, which yeah. some people can monetize on, some people can develop as, as academic projects, etc. So it's, it's up to them as to how they use it. That's use great. And so, and so this is the Music Tech Fest, which is uh, right. the second edition is happening in, three, in three weeks. That's uh, correct. Uh, it's happening in three weeks' time. Uh, so the dates are... Uh, what is it, the 20th? 17th to the 19th of May. Great. The 18th and 19th being the weekend when all the hackers are active. So we're doing the 3D Music Hack Camp where people are encouraged to, this year to make mu uh, instruments out of everything that anything I can find. Right. Um, and what I, what I love about that is, uh, and I don't want to sort of throw big words at people, but it, to me it's democratization of music making. Yeah. Because... Um, once upon a time, you had to have parents who can afford to buy a piano, and uh, you, in order to have an instrument in the house, you know, uh, it, they cost uh, money. Now you can get yourself an Arduino, you can get yourself some sensors super cheaply. If you are creative enough, you can actually turn anything into an instrument, yeah. and you can be really creative with it and start looking for new sounds, which, we, which is what we're really excited about. Um, what's wonderful about that as well is that the labels seem to have woken to, up to the fact that there's there's this new scene um, and there's some um, potentially interesting things that are coming out of it um, and uh, they are now they've put forward some uh, signed artists names to look at um, some of these aspects so for instance just recently had, um, had an exchange with um, Jamie Cullum managers because Jamie's uh, you know, we, we, we said to them he should really try the new piano um, he would call the seaboard yeah um, sure and looked it up it's 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 a fabulous new I tried it out in South Bay <laughs> we'd love to have someone like that um, uh, try it um, and uh, it turned out when they spoke to him that he'd already heard about it and he'd really wanted to try it so we're trying to arrange for that to happen 
yeah. uh, at the moment. Um, that's that's uh, they're they're talking to. I just I just hooked them up the two, yeah, sure. two sides, and I just so said, okay, you guys talk. You know, we we we're not it's, we're not doing it for uh, any other reason that we want to actually have these two sides joined together because yeah. we find that's that that's where it becomes really exciting. Thing. Absolutely, and so it was like, you know it's the same in the same way as as when you people saw Bjork playing with the reactable table back in the day, and they were like going crazy, like what is this? What is this? And of this? course, she's she's a pioneer, and so is Imogen Heap, who is using new uh, the, the the glove in order to, uh, for uh, uh, connect to the Ableton in yeah. order to uh, to create a performance uh, from it. So these are the pioneers in this space, absolutely. Um, and of course, uh, people like Carlos Lopez, who is a DJ on the Reactable. Um, there are there are people now who exclusively perform with the iPad, uh, Reactable on the iPad. Yeah. Um, there are people who are really operating in that space, and they're the real pioneers. Um, but you know, it's it's one of we're kind of here, and it's kind yeah. of doing this. And I quite like being. Yeah. Right there. It's a and question of bringing, yeah, bringing it. Yeah, that, that's I usually operate in that spot. That, yeah. That's sort of the kickstart sort of things. Um, and we, this year we're also doing an art hack um, in sync with the uh, music hack. Uh, last year we sold out on the art workshops uh, before anything else. It was like 70 odd people who subscribed immediately. It was about synesthesia, about yeah. turning uh, music into, um, uh, turning color into a sound. And uh, we developed an app which you can still download it's called synesthesia on, on the iTunes store. Um, spelt in a European way, is in A E or a Latin way rather. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, that's still popular. That sort of you can go around, scan colors, and uh, it, the accelerometer will will uh, using the accelerometer you can change the pitch and you can modulate the sound. Um, and, and people were last year at the festival wearing the festival T-shirts, which are all in very bright colors. Yeah. Uh, same as on the front of our website, which is music. To like uh, fest.org, uh, you can kind of use the different colors to play them as a keyboard and yeah. they, they have samples attached to them. So, um, oh, the reason why we wrote that was that people we wanted people to come together in some way or other because they all come from very different backgrounds sure. and encourage them to interact. So they all pointed their um, phone to each other's t-shirt and read the color from it and they were able to jam together That's as great. a result. That was really popular. This year, the art hack, we are running... Um, a hundred years since Russolo published uh, The Art of Noise. Right. Noise is, uh, um, so basically uh, one of the futurists, uh, so one of the, one of the Italian, one of the famous Italian guys. Yeah. Um, and uh, because he said, let's make noise with anything we can find. So it was kind of totally John Cage, but you know. That's great. 1913 John Cage. And, um, of course, we're saying, okay, it's been a hundred years, let's make music with anything. Because what we're doing is counterposing the whole well oiled machinery of the music industry, which produces terribly slick productions. And that's, but you know, we look at it as one way of doing things. And what we can do is do it in very different ways. We can, we can take all the components apart, we can start recreating the noise or the yeah. sound. Um, and look at what ha what can possibly happen in that space. That's great. Well, thank you so much. And I, again, uh, I would encourage the audience to go and check out a few websites. So uh, starting with uh, stromatolite.com and uh, then we move on to musictechfest.org, which is the event that's running. So if you are in London and uh, you're free uh, that uh, weekend, it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think it's, it runs on, uh, you definitely uh, should go and check it out and, uh, and come along. And it's one of the very, very few events these days that are free. So uh, you don't have any excuses on the budget front. So definitely that's right. yeah, to yeah. try and make it down. <laughs> Come along, register for free, uh, it's on Eventbrite, and uh, come along and join us and just interact with everyone. Um, this On Sunday we have a trio of beatboxers, there's a guy who's now writing an app for them to um, beatbox, uh, like a three-way beatboxing app. Awesome. Um, we have uh, a J uh, Jason Singh, um, who's uh, just a, a phenomenal beatboxer, he was there last year and the crowd went crazy. So Jason, uh, we have Shlomo and we have Ezra, who's coming up in France, 
Um, so uh, there's some very interesting uh, things that are happening on that front. So yeah, awesome. come and join, register and come and join us. Great. Well, I'll definitely see you there. And uh, thanks so much for your time. It was a very interesting uh, interview and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Andrea. If you enjoyed the show, remember to check out our weekly music tech news show on digitalmusictrends.com.